Welcome to Faith Talk with Anita. Thank you for joining me on the journey. Thank you for spending this time with me. I appreciate you for making this Faith Talk a part of your day. In my last Faith Talk, I shared my frustrations about certain church laws, as well as decrees and actions on the part of some bishops that cause despair and pain for many people, leading many of them to leave the church. I just can't imagine that could possibly be what Jesus wanted or expected from his disciples. As I reflected on this, I kept coming back to one word, compassion. Over and over again in the Gospels, we read of Jesus's compassion for all people. It is precisely the compassion of Christ that should be the foundation of the church, central to everything and everyone in the church today. And that's what this Faith Talk is all about. Now, I'm speaking specifically from a Roman Catholic perspective, but this issue surely pertains to the entire Christian church at large. Let me begin with the definition of compassion. The word literally means to suffer together. The dictionary definition is sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. Compassion is what allows us to show mercy and forgiveness. Words that describe Jesus to a T. He was compassionate merciful, and forgiving. He literally came to suffer with and for us all. And he encourages us to do the same for every other human on earth. Here are just a few passages from the Gospels that illustrate Jesus's compassion. In Mark chapter 1, we read about a leper who begged Jesus for healing. Jesus was moved with pity for the man, and he healed him. In Matthew chapter 20, we are told that when two blind men approached Jesus, he was moved with pity, and he healed them. In Luke chapter 7, we read the story of the widow whose only son had died. We are told that Jesus had compassion for her and raised the man to life. And in Matthew chapter 14, we read the story of the feeding of 5,000. Matthew tells us that when he saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them, and he cured their sick. Jesus didn't personally know any of these people. They were just people he came across during his ministry. In none of these stories does Jesus concern himself with their sinfulness or unworthiness. He never asks them if they have followed all the rules or if they are in good standing with religious leaders. He simply shows compassion for them, cares for them, and helps them. Father Richard Rohr offered some thoughts about this in his daily meditation. He said, Quote, the point in all the healing stories of the Gospels is not simply that Jesus can work miracles. What Jesus does, quite simply, is feed people's immediate needs. He doesn't talk to them about spiritual things, heavenly things, or churchy things. He doesn't give a sermon about going to church. The important thing that God seems to want to be doing in history is to create a community of compassion where people care about one another. Jesus never once talked about attending church services, but he talked constantly about healing the sick and feeding the hungry. That is what it seems to mean to be a follower of Jesus. End quote. 
I like that. Jesus intended to create a community of compassion whose primary concern was caring for one another's immediate needs, whether that be physical, emotional, or spiritual. This community of compassion is precisely what our church should be in the world today. As I think about the church as a community of compassion, I think of three main levels, if you will. The first level is a general call to all Christians. We all need to have compassion for one another. The second layer is equally important, but not often considered by most of us, I think. And that is self-compassion. And the third level is one that is vital for the good of the church. And that is the compassion of the bishops for the people within the church. We think of the bishops as leaders, teachers, and lawmakers. And so they are. But I'm not sure we always associate that with compassion. Let me speak briefly about each of these. First, and most obvious, is that all people should have compassion for all people. This was Jesus' main message. Just think about two of his most famous quotes, the Golden Rule and the Greatest Commandment. Jesus said, Do to others whatever you would have them do to you. And... Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. These two lessons fit the definition of compassion completely. Sympathetic concern for the suffering or misfortunes of others. Jesus clearly wants us to make the concerns and needs of others a priority. That's what he taught, and that's what he modeled, and that's what he calls each of us, as his disciples, to do as well. Second, self-compassion. I think many of us don't often take this level of compassion into account. We know we must have compassion for others, but we don't think of ourselves in the same way. Quite often, we are our own worst critics. We condemn ourselves when we don't live up to what we perceive to be ideal Christian standards. I know so many people who stress over every little thing. If they fall short and don't live perfectly within every law and guideline of the church, they beat themselves up. I certainly don't think that level of perfectionist anxiety is what Jesus wants for any of us, which I believe is why he reminded us that we owe compassion to ourselves as well as to others. Remember that he said, love your neighbor as yourself. We can only love our neighbor as ourself if we, in fact, love ourself. Look, none of us are perfect. We are all just ordinary human beings doing the best we can. And sometimes our best falls short and doesn't reach the standard that church officials have set. We need to be okay with that as long as we're doing our best. Because our best is all we can do. And Jesus understands that. Jesus still loves us, despite our failures, despite our sinfulness, despite our feelings of unworthiness, and despite anyone else's opinion on the matter. If we are disciples of Jesus and we strive to live according to the model he gave us, 
then we must offer ourselves the same compassion that he offers us and that we offer to others. What might self-compassion look like? Well, we might be gentler with ourselves. We might allow ourselves to fall short of perfection. We might forgive ourselves for our failures. We might give ourselves second and third chances. All the things we would do for others. Finally, let's look at the bishops. The Catechism of the Catholic Church defines a bishop as successor of the apostles and the shepherd of a particular church entrusted to him. The Catechism says, the bishops have by divine institution taken the place of the apostles as pastors of the church. St. Ignatius of Antioch said the bishop is like the living image of God the Father. Reading these descriptions, it is clear that the bishops are considered to be Christ's representatives on earth. They have full authority within the church, which means they make all the decisions. That's a big responsibility, one that should never be taken lightly. To be sure, bishops are vital to the church. We need them. But we need them to have a compassionate heart for all people, just as Jesus did. And certainly, every institution needs rules and guidelines. But those rules and guidelines should never take priority over the welfare of the people. When Jesus gave Peter a leadership role in the church, he told him to feed my lambs and tend my sheep. With those tender words, Jesus was instructing Peter to care for people, to make their needs a priority. Peter's role was meant to be one of love, mercy, forgiveness, and compassion, not of power or judgment or condemnation. Remember when Jesus met with the woman caught in adultery? He said to her, Has no one condemned you? She replied, No one, sir. Then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. And in John chapter 12, Jesus said, I did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. This should be the same for our bishops today. If they are to be Christ's representatives on earth, their role must not be to judge or condemn, but to save and to love. As our pastors, they should be models for us to follow, compassionate, merciful, and forgiving. As our good shepherds, they should gently guide us and care for our needs. Jesus didn't say to Peter, make sure everyone follows all the laws. He didn't tell Peter to judge people and make sure they are worthy. No, he said, feed and care for my sheep. That's it. We need the bishops to be compassionate as Christ was compassionate, to be merciful as Christ was merciful, to be forgiving as Christ was forgiving. My friends, Jesus modeled compassionate living. He instructs us to have compassionate hearts and form a community of compassion. It is up to us, all of us, to learn from him and follow his ways. If we can do that, the church will truly be the body of Christ on earth, and the world will be transformed. 
Can you just imagine it? I can. Let us pray. Creator God, help your church to be a community of compassion. Lord, give me a compassionate heart. Open my eyes and ears to those in need. And help me to be compassionate with myself, trusting in your great mercy. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. Please join me in my next Faith Talk. Until then, you will be in my prayers. May God bless you.